Good morning and welcome to your last video lecture. I'm sure you're excited to hear that. Uh, today we're going to talk about Reconstruction. This is kind of how the Civil War ends and it's going to be a little bit rushed. Normally this would be two days worth of class time, but I can only spend one on it because i got to get you working on your final exam. So here you go. Uh, planning for Reconstruction. Um, when the war ended, or when the war was approaching an end, I should say, there were two plans. Uh, Abraham Lincoln proposed something called the Proclamation of Amnesty and Reconstruction, better known as Lincoln's 10% plan. And under Lincoln's 10% plan, what he was going to do is a minority of voters who voted in 1860 uh, had to take an oath of allegiance to the United States. They had to approve emancipation, meaning giving up the slaves. Uh, once that 10% was discovered and took the oath, then a new state government could be created. And Lincoln's 10% plan said that no Confederate officials, no Confederate military leaders could become citizens of the United States until they received a presidential pardon. Lincoln's 10% plan made that uh, had no plans for African American voting. Uh, Lincoln's 10% plan, basically a slap on the wrist. Lincoln's goal, remember he's a politician, was to show the people of the South that the Republicans weren't bad and hopefully encourage the growth of a Republican Party in the South. On the other hand, you have the Wade Davis Bill. Uh, it's proposed by a guy named Benjamin Wade from Ohio and Henry Davis from Maryland. They get together, they come up with a plan that says 50%, half of all people who voted in 1860 must take an oath of allegiance and must approve emancipation. Once you get that 50%, then a ma that majority can elect delegates to create a new state constitution. Once that new state constitution is approved, then a state could be created. Now, the only way you could be counted in that 50% is if you take what was called an ironclad oath that stated you never supported the Confederacy. Now, that's really hard to do because what's considered support? Is it support if you send your, your soldier son socks? Is it support if you send your brother a letter? Uh, Wade Davis, they never really say what exactly support is. Um, also, the Wade Davis bill, no African American voting. Now, Lincoln didn't like the Wade Davis bill. Congress didn't like Lincoln's plan. So when the war ended, there were zero plans ready to go because Lincoln vetoes the Wade Davis bill and Congress never authorizes Lincoln's plan. So two plans on the table, zero of them work after the war is over. You also have to plan for emancipation, the freedom of the slaves. Uh, in January of 1863, Abraham Lincoln issues the Emancipation Proclamation and the, the uh, purpose of the war changes from just saving the Union to ending slavery. Now just like there's no plan on how to reconstruct the South, there's really no plan on what to do with the slaves. Uh, they have questions about who's going to be in control. Is the army going to be in control? Is it the treasury? Is it somebody else? There are questions about who's going to help. Is it businessmen? Is it church missionaries? Is it freedmen groups? Abolition groups? They don't know. Uh, when it comes down to it, though, there are three main groups that are going to handle emancipation. One group is going to be the Union Army. Now, the Union Army, they can only help for so long because they only keep enough supplies for the Army. So there's only a little bit of food that they can give away. There's only, uh, basically, they give a tent, they give a blanket, and then they say, here you go, uh, wait for somebody else to come. Uh, there are U.S. Treasury agents, and because they're dealing with money, they want to get slaves, back, well, former slaves now, back to work as quickly as possible. And then you have private businessmen who have gained leases on farmland, and they need these former slaves to work the land. <coughs> Excuse me. So it's all about labor. How do we get the most labor out of these former slaves? How do we make the most money off of these former slaves? Now eventually these former slaves, they are going to receive freedom. Sometimes the freedom comes right away, sometimes it takes a little while. Um, as the Union Army comes through, a lot of slaves start to realize they're free. 
other places, these former slaves are going to wait until everything is done because they're afraid that their, their master is going to come back or something's going to happen with the war. So even though you know, there's freedom, not everybody goes free at the same time and not everybody has the same idea of freedom either. Now the assistance for these former slaves is going to be done through something called the Bureau of Refugees, Freedmen, and Abandoned Lands. On the test you're going to see something called the Freedmen's Bureau. That is the shorthand name of that group. The Bureau of Refugees, Freedmen, and Abandoned Lands, that is the Freedmen's Bureau. Now the Freedmen's Bureau, they're going to give food, clothing, legal assistance, medical care, and education to these freed men. Um, they're going to help these former slaves find their family. They're going to help these former slaves decide where they should live, how they should make a living. Uh, they're going to give, obviously, direct assistance. And you might be curious about legal assistance. Well, that's because a lot of these former slaves can't read. And the Freedmen's Bureau was trying to make sure that these former slaves didn't sign unequal contracts. You also have Northern Missionary Societies. They're going to set up schools in the South, and they're going to base this on work they've done in Africa. So they're going to uh, extrapolate that former slaves are just like African people, and they're going to set up schools based on the models they used in Africa. And then last but not least, you're going to have African American churches that are created by a lot of missionary groups. And this allows the, the um, Southern Blacks to create a community all their own. It allows Southern Blacks a place to worship on their own. And it's going to be a form of education because a lot of education is going to be done in the uh, Sunday schools. Now what were the conditions of these former slaves? Well, more often than not, they're going to have a job very similar to the job they did when they were a slave. If they were a field hand as a slave, they're going to be a field hand when they're free. If they were a blacksmith when they were a slave, they're going to be a blacksmith when they're free. You get the idea. Uh, the biggest difference is they're paid now. But what pay they earn goes straight back to somebody for food, clothing, and medical. So even though they're technically getting paid, they still have nothing. Uh, labor is forced. It's <clears throat> labor... Having a job is labeled a public duty, and it became a crime to be unemployed. It became a crime to be homeless. <coughs> Excuse me. And in the South, there are these things called black codes. You're going to see black codes on the final exam. I want you to know if I never see you again, and I, I hope I see you in another class, but if I never see you again, one of the most important things that you should know about this part of our history black codes are not the same as Jim Crow laws. Jim Crow laws come in around 1900, black codes 1865 as soon as the Civil War is over. So with these black codes it becomes illegal to be unemployed and if you're unemployed uh, you could be arrested or you could be fined. Well we know that these former slaves they're not getting any of the pay that they earn because it's got, all going to be used for food, clothing, and medical. So that means that these former slaves, they don't have any money to pay a fine. They can't bail themselves out. So what would happen? Very often their former slave owner or some wealthy former confederate would pay off their fine or pay their bail and then the former slave has to work for that former owner until they pay off their debt. And I can guarantee they did not make it easy to pay that debt off. So Black Codes, in a way, continues slavery. It's just unofficial slavery now. Black Codes, they restricted your movements. They would keep you from owning land. They would keep you from renting land, which meant you had to work for somebody else. It was also a crime to break a contract. It was a crime to, send, to assemble in large numbers, and in some places, large numbers were considered three or more people. And then it was also illegal to act in an insulting manner towards a white person, and that is purposely never defined. The black codes are basically a gotcha 
so that control of black citizens can be put back into the hands of southern white citizens. All right, President Andrew Johnson. Uh, this is the guy who becomes president after Abraham Lincoln is assassinated in April of 1865. This is Lincoln's second vice president. Uh, Lincoln, when he was reelected, he chose a different vice president and he purposely chose Andrew Johnson. And this was a weird pick because, first of all, Andrew Johnson is a Democrat from Tennessee. And secondly, he thought the South was right. Now, the reason that Lincoln chose Johnson is Lincoln didn't run in 1864 as a Republican. He ran as a Unionist. He wanted to repair the country. So even though he was technically a Republican, he didn't run under a Republican ticket. And that's why he chose Andrew Johnson, because he thought this would help the South see that they're going to be okay. Now, Andrew Johnson, because he was a Southerner, he thought that the South was doing perfectly fine. In fact, Andrew Johnson said all the Southern states had met the recommendation of Reconstruction in 1866 and started to welcome these Southern states back in. Andrew Johnson wanted to restore property to all the Southerners. He wanted the Southerners to give an oath to support the Constitution. And he wanted the Southerners to accept the 13th Amendment we'll talk to in a minute. But other than that, he said, everything's fine. Uh, he voted against the Freedmen's Bureau Act. He voted against the Civil Rights Act. He vetoed both of those. And because Andrew Johnson and this Republican Congress don't get along, the Republican Congress, they accuse Andrew Johnson of high crimes and misdemeanors. And there's a whole story behind this that I'll, I'll just tell you briefly. Um, the Congress, they passed something called the Oath of Office Act. And that made the Andrew Johnson unable to fire people he should have been able to fire. And when Andrew Johnson attempts to fire his Secretary of War, uh, that's what triggers this whole accusation of high crimes and misdemeanors. So Andrew Johnson is impeached. He is the first president out of three to be impeached. And he keeps his presidency by one vote. Now, because he has been severely wounded, a lot of his power has been taken away. For the rest of Andrew Johnson's presidency, he doesn't do a whole lot. Republicans, specifically these radical Republicans, that, such as Thaddeus Stevens, who you should read about this week, they're going to win the election and they're just going to take control of everything when it comes to Reconstruction. So we get this period called Radical Reconstruction that starts in 1866-1867. And you have the Reconstruction Act of 1867. It gets rid of all the state governments that President Johnson had created, except for one. Tennessee is allowed to stay as a courtesy because that's where Andrew Johnson is from. The Reconstruction Act, it creates five military districts. Basically, you got martial law. Uh, the, the Union Army comes in, there's something like 25,000 troops patrolling the South. And the Reconstruction Act, in, it requires all these Southern states to make new constitutions that guarantee black voting rights. Radical Reconstructionists, they also give the Freedmen Bureau more money so it can continue to do its work. Unfortunately, the Freedmen Bureau, it goes broke by by 1872. And the southern states are going to become dominated by Republicans. Now just a side note, a lot of southern states today are dominated by Republicans, but it's not the same Republicans as here. These Republicans who are in control of the South, it's for a very short time. It's from 1865 to about 1876. And then from 1876 until really 2010 in a lot of places, the South is a strong Democratic place. Um, almost every state is going to have a Democratic governor. Almost every presidential vote is going to go for a Democratic president. Almost every state legislator is going to be led by a Democrat from the 1870s up until about the 2010s. So today's Republican control of the South is a very new thing historically. Now why were, were Southern states allowed to be, become Republican at that time? 
It's mainly due to uh, the inability or the disenfranchisement of Southern voters and the voting rights of former slaves. Southern voters could not vote and they overwhelmingly would have voted Democrat. The former slaves, they're going to vote for the party of Lincoln and African Americans vote for Republicans all the way up until around World War II and after World War II that starts to change. Now there are attacks against Reconstruction. There are some political attacks. There are conservatives who appeal to whites based on the idea, the idea of race, the idea of power. There are also violent attacks and there are two groups. There's the Red Shirts who are, uh, they're a paramilitary group and their goal was to return the Democratic Party to power so they used intimidation and they're eventually going to be folded into and become part of the KKK. And then you have the Ku Klux Klan itself. It started as a social fraternity in a place called Pulaski, Tennessee. It was started by a guy named Nathan Bedford Forrest who was a, a uh, general for the South during the Confederacy. And eventually it turns into this violent fraternity with um, all the bells and whistles that you know today, the white hats, the cross burning, the robes, etc., etc. Uh, the KKK, they targeted black voters, but that's not all. They were also after white Republicans, leaders of unions, meaning labor unions, and agents of the Freedmen's Bureau. Now another quick note on the KKK, the KKK we have today is not the same Ku Klux Klan as we're talking about here. This Ku Klux Klan died out in the 1870s and then it came back in the 19 teens. So today's KKK is a second generation, if you will. Now, how does Congress respond to this? Well, they issue the Enforcement Act that's going to outlaw violence and the KKK Act that specifically outlaws the Ku Klux Klan. Uh, this is going to allow federal troops to protect African Americans, arrest Klan members, prosecute Klan members in court. It supervised elections in the South. And by 1872, the Klan activity comes to an end in the South, but it's not because of the KKK. It's because Democratic leaders start to take control of Southern states again. Now, there are three amendments that you do need to know. The first one is the 13th Amendment. It was ratified on December 6th of 1865. That means it had enough states sign it to make it go into law. And the 13th Amendment is what officially ends slavery. Now, the, the last state to ratify this, Mississippi. And it doesn't ratify it until 1994. Just a little, little trivia pursuit information for you. But it's the 13th Amendment that's going to end slavery officially. Then you've got the 14th Amendment. That's ratified on July 9th, 1868. And that's what's going to make all the former slaves citizens. Basically, the 14th Amendment is what undoes the Dred Scott decision from a couple weeks ago that said that African Americans were not citizens. Well, the 14th Amendment is what changes that. And then finally, you have the 15th Amendment, which is ratified on February 26th of 1869. And the 15th Amendment is what gives every male the right to vote. Females, you get your right to vote in 1920. All males get the right to vote in 1869. The 15th Amendment looks good. It says uh, you cannot deny the right to vote based on race, color, or servitude. But there's a lot of loopholes. And so you get things like the poll tax. You get things like um, the, the literacy test. You get things like um, citizenship questions. And in reality, your average poor white and your average poor black, they would not be able to pay the poll tax. Your average poor white, your average poor black would not be able to pass the literacy test. So a lot of people, when we're in face-to-face -face class, ask, well, how did whites get to vote and blacks didn't? It's because of this thing called the grandfather clause. If your grandfather could vote, you were allowed to vote. And there's not a single African American out there who was allowed to vote because Dred Scott said, you're not citizens. 
So how did all this play out? Um, I'll just talk you through that real quick because it's not on the test. Um, in 1872, well, I should say, sorry, from 1868, uh, Ulysses S. Grant, he's elected president. He's not a great president, uh, although his reputation is starting to change now. But there was a lot of corruption during his presidency. Like his brother-in-law tried to corner the gold market and manipulate how much gold was worth. Uh, his vice president gets caught uh, taking profits from the Union Pacific Railroad. Um, his personal secretary is caught taking bribes from whiskey makers and saying, uh, your whiskey tax is paid and pocketing the money. And then his own Secretary of War is caught taking bribes to sell government positions and stealing money from veterans. Uh, Grant says, I didn't know anything about this stuff, but it really makes the government look bad. And by the time we get to 1876, the next president, Rutherford B. Hayes, makes a deal and says, hey, if you elect me president, I'll end this whole Reconstruction thing. We'll just go along our way. So when you get down to it, Reconstruction is really only half done, and that's going to lead to a lot of the racial tension all the way up until the 1960s, which is talked about very much if you take U.S. history, too. All right, you're probably waiting for a secret word, and I must tell you, there's no secret word in this lecture. Um, you got your final exam. Uh, you can take your final exam now. Good luck on that. It is going to be due on Sunday the 3rd. I've also changed your museum review and your fourth reflection paper. They're going to be due on December 3rd. Or May 3rd, I'm sorry. May 3rd for the museum review. May 3rd for the fourth reflection paper. And May 3rd for the final exam. Last but not least, if you have any suggestions on what I could do to make these videos better for the summer class, please email me. This is the first time I had to do this and I'm going to have to do it all summer. So I look forward to hearing what you have to say and how I can help your fellow students do better and what I can do to improve this for fellow students. All right, it's been an interesting semester. Thank you for putting up with it. Thank you for getting through it. Hope to see some of you again and good luck. We'll talk to you later.